Welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hi, Jolie. Hey. So today we're going to talk about grieving relationship change. Important work. Um, we have had conversations about this already. It is so important. Change, change, well, means something isn't true anymore. Mm. And for good or bad, uh, the change could be good or bad, and you could still have stuff to grieve. I appreciate that. So uh, instantly I felt the somber tone, which you have a great voice. I have a great for voice somber for somber tone. Somber. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I sound like a chipmunk. Um, but there is a, a reverence around the idea of grieving. So let's first say I want to expand our definition of grieving a little bit I like and, that. and say, you know, grieving is the the psychological state and of, of experiencing loss. And, you know, if I turn to say like the APA's definition of grieving, um, they say it's an anguished state. Um, but we already know from other definitions they have that they tend to be a little bit one-sided. But I, I do think, you know, anguish is a way for it to go. But remember, it's just an exacerbated state. It's It, it tends to be yeah. big. And that big might come with feelings like numbness or frozen, which doesn't feel big the way that weeping and crying and and or railing and being angry like we our grief can be colored by numerous other emotional states including love like yeah. uh, the memories of the love for the thing that you have lost can like if if that's your focus then that is very different from like the rage of having lost it right so there are a lot of different ways they're not all somber but I think it's really important to talk about grief also beyond the context of death because so much grief uh, material is written around death. And even, again, going back to that APA definition, um, it, the, the next sentence in it is usually um, usually after the loss of a, signi a significant loved one, you know, the death of a, of, of a loved mm -hmm. one. That is so That's not… really narrow. <laughs> that is… That is a tiny fragment of the grieving we will do. So yeah, let's expand this to be grieving change. Grieving yeah. as in feeling big feelings about change. Not even just loss, but change. Change, yep. And I, uh, yeah, I want to break down the idea that grief is something reserved for a particular set of changes like death. No, there, there are lots of things to grieve. I grieve when I get a stain on my favorite shirt. Well, that that is literally favorite. an active. Which one's my favorite? I no, I mean like it, but it was your favorite. But it was my favorite. No, that that is like that the the emotions associated with a change like that warrant grieving. And that Maybe. so what I'm hearing you say is it does not Using the word grief to describe what you're experiencing and the active mourning that you might need to do does not diminish the fact that you grieved your father's death when you were 17 years old. Right. Yeah. It does not like using that yep. word. So yes, all there are there are degrees of this and it's entirely subjective. Yes. Like, I mean, how how great was that shirt? Might have been really, really great. Really good know. shirt. So comfortable. Yeah. I kid. But but also our um our ability to ability to acknowledge when we have big feelings uh, of loss around change. So let's add that to the definition. Big feelings of loss due to change. So sometimes I experience change that feels entirely additive. Entirely. Mm -hmm. That's rare. That's rare. Generally speaking, when change happens, we also lose something. Yeah. We lose okay, the way yeah. things were before. We lose the version ourselves that we thought we were. We lose the version of our partner that we thought we had. We lose the relationship as it was, even though like, whoa, this new way that I'm being is amazing. And there was still all of what came before needs to be honored. And 
we lose the imagined future. Yes. So previous to this change, there was an imagined future. And even if you never spent any time daydreaming about that future, that's just how the human mind works for the vast majority of people, not everyone, um, but the vast, vast majority of people, there is an imagined future. And you don't have to be consciously aware of what you imagined was going to happen for it to just be pinging around in your in your unconscious, creating a story for you about what you will have. And therefore, this change now means now you've lost something because you've lost this thing that you expected, even yes. if you expected it unconsciously. So a, a great example of that that has been in my life recently is I had a friend who always just assumed they would be a mother at some point in their life and never really thought much about it and now is in her early 40s and is reckoning with her life and is realizing that she always thought she'd be a mother. But she never told, she never even talked about it. It wasn't a thing. She just always thought eventually it would happen. And so right now in her early 40s, she's really grappling with like, oh, it's not, oh, I've been on the fence and I haven't really known. That's true that for her conscious awareness and her conscious self. She thought, yeah, I don't, I don't really know whether I want to have kids or not. And I'm not really sure whether I want that life. But her, on an unconscious level, she has now recognized, no, there was, a, there was at least a part of me that just believed that I would live I would become a mother. I would die a mother. I would be a mother. And now she's grappling with, oh, you know what? I don't think that's in the cards. And I think I'm I'm going to decide to own that reality for myself. Not because I can't become a mother right now, but because I think I'm going to decide that's not what I'm doing. I'm going to let go of that. But she's now having to grieve the imagined future that she didn't even know she had. Yeah. And that happens all the time in monogamous um, transitions. There is a a presumption when you follow a path of compulsory monogamy, default monogamy, or just happy, like, yeah, we liked monogamy and now we don't. And so what does that mean about all the things, all the ways we used to talk about life, all yeah, the versions right. of growing old together and doing things a certain way? And how do I grieve something I didn't have? I haven't lived that life yet. <laughs> But, and yet there it is. Being, and yet I'm clearly really having feels about it. Yep. So can we talk about what it means to grieve something? Yeah. Well, like what is it exactly we're talking about when we say that? Well, let's sort out um, two concepts. There's a difference between grieving and mourning. Um, there, there are two words that can help us understand the 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 actions of this, these emotions. So grieving, in my understanding, is the emotion. It's the way that we describe the, okay. the somatic sensations leading to the, the, the emotion that I feel and the story I tell about this change resulting in a sense of loss. So when we say grieving as a verb, we're saying experiencing the emotion of grief in yeah. its complexity. Okay. Yeah. Mourning. And this is where, I mean, I myself, I fall, I fall fault to, I use the word grieving when sometimes I really mean mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning. The, the mourning is the act of grieving. It is, what am I doing? What, um, how am I, how am I allowing myself to process this emotion of grieving, either ritually or through conversation or through um, action, symbolic actions that I take? How am I, how am I being an active participant in my grieving? An active participant. That's helpful. Because so I could sit in a room and feel grief which can be very complicated in terms of my somatic experience and my emotional and cognitive experience. And if I not, if I don't do anything to acknowledge any of that, I haven't started mourning. I'm just grieving. Yeah. Just yep. I, I think that's a fair thing to say. And, and it's not a hard line. This is a subjective thing. You know, there are internal actions that I can take that, that are, I would call mourning. You know, um, if I am speaking to a higher power within me, I might call that that act of prayer. I might call that mourning. Um, if I am having 
if I'm starting to work on my dreams that are coming up while I'm grieving, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, it's a very inner process, but I would say that's an active mourning technique. Um, but then there are simple things. Like if, if someone dies, often we schedule some sort of ritual as the, like the way of, of collectively grieving this loss. We schedule a, a funeral, a wake, a memorial. We schedule something. And the act of coming together includes there are some expectations, right? Like often there are expectations. There's a there are some norms and different norms depending on what microculture you are in um, about what you'll do to grieve a death. And so when we're talking about the context of relationship change, we can be very excited about the way that we're changing our life and still need to do the grieving and even the mourning of what was in order to really facilitate moving into this, this new way of being. And I find that when people skip this step, there's a price to be paid. And they, they, so many people refuse, they reject the, the grieving work. Um, I, I ha it's built into the year of opening. Grieving is just part of what we do um, and planning and ritualizing our, our mourning processes. And it's not the same for everyone. Some people leap in and they're like, oh, I've been needing to do this for so long. Other people are like, I have been grieving this change for years. I don't, I don't have any more yeah. in me. Yeah. So for some people, it's going to be a small thing. For some people, it's going to be a huge thing. But the act of deciding to like plant both feet and, and say, I'm going to participate in this change and I'm going to do my grieving work, and I'm going to share it a little bit in public. I'm, and public can be a closed container, right? So like inside the, the year of opening, I ask people to share like, okay, so what, what are you letting go of? What's the transition you're going through? What imagined future are you not having? A, a common one is I'm letting go of the, the white picket fence, disnified version of marriage. I'm not letting go of my marriage, but I'm letting go of that vision of it. Okay. For other people, it's something like, I'm letting go of the idea that exclusivity is how I will feel valued. I'm going to let go of that. And that is, so that's big yeah. inner work. These mm -hmm. are big topics, right? And and they are, they are changes that, um, that people have chosen. And the yeah. fact that they chose it, that they chose the change, doesn't mean they're not going to grieve. Yeah, can I uh, dig into that just a little bit? Let's do. Um, some people f like realize, like, oh, I, I'm not, I'm not choosing. I want to be clear. Ugh. Calling non-monogamy or polyamory a lifestyle choice is not an authentic way of describing it for many people. For mm -hmm. many people, this is this is not. Oh, I'm choosing to live a different lifestyle. It's okay. Yeah. So instead, it would be I'm choosing to acknowledge that I that mm. I swim against the mainstream or I'm choosing to allow myself to actually live authentically. And I, I'm, I'm naming that because I feel a little resistance myself to the idea that I'm choosing this as if like, oh, well, I could just choose not to and life would be simpler. I see what you mean. Right. So, but, but choosing to acknowledge the change that you're going through is that, it, that is a choice. And and if you choose to ignore the change that you're going through, it's that's a choice still, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, you and I had one of our earliest really powerful conversations for me with you was uh, 18, nine, 19 years ago now when I was like, you know, I see you choosing not to choose. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to you, that's a choice. Yeah. I did not know that my father had taught me some Sartre. I didn't, I didn't know that, but that was a message I had gotten from my father early on that any time I chose not to choose when I had a decision in front of me, that was me choosing. And you pushed hard against that back then. And then I saw you actually relax. You put like, you pushed hard in dialogue with me and then you relax and realize like, oh, the cool thing is if you recognize that, then you do know what your choice is. That's right. Yep. Like whatever you were yep. avoiding saying, that's the thing that's you want. That's the thing you want. Yes. 
so so the the resistance isn't your enemy. The resistance to choosing isn't actually your enemy. It's, it's information. It's information. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say you know that you are going through this like relational shift, and you are aware enough of it to acknowledge that that means that there are both inner changes and outer changes, as in there are inner psychological changes happening, and there are there are life changes. There are practical changes. Like you may find that all of a sudden you're, you're doing differentiation work, which means you're intentionally not sleeping next to your partner every night. And that doesn't have to be because you're out on dates. That could be because you're just saying, oh, we're going to work on, on enmeshing in our sleep areas and see how that informs who we are as, as people. Those are acts that I wouldn't necessarily call mourning. I would say those are the acts you're doing to experience the change. I but, see the difference <laughs> there. Yeah, that is the that is the action of the change. The experimenting. Right. The and learning. Then, and then And then there's the your feelings about feelings it. about it will come up. And then the morning it would be what you do in response to the feelings about the ch- the thing that you did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I I noticed that a lot of people have grief over the fact that their connection to other people is changing. Maybe your connection to someone you've been partnered with for a long yeah. time is changing because this doesn't work for them. Maybe you come to realize that, you know, you have a partnership where one person wants a monogamous relationship, the other wants polyamorous, and that doesn't work for, for either of you. Or maybe you realize, oh, we're actually monopoly. This does work, but wow, we have a very different reality. This does right. work. We do want to do it. And now we have a new reality. Or maybe you're you're coming up against, oh... Um, so we made this shift, we're enjoying lots of it. And now I feel like I can't share all of myself with my friends because I'm afraid of what their responses would be. Mm -hmm. I hear the snide comments they make about, um, about swingers or about people who are sex positive and I don't want to come out to them. Right. So now I, I'm grieving my friends knowing me. These are all different ways that you might have big feelings and you might want to, Bring some intentionality to the process because if you bring intentionality to your grief and you take symbolic action, that's the technology that humans have been using since time immemorial. In all cultures across all times, we we use the technology of grieving and mourning to allow ourselves to experience that change that is happening in the outer world and the inner world to allow us to experience it fully and with intention and to allow it to no longer be a raw open wound but instead yeah. to to be a a thing that we are healing through not not healing back to but healing, healing through, through into our new version of ourselves th- to the new thing would you say that the in the absence of of grieving and mourning, a change has occurred and I've decided, nope, I'm just going to push on. Um, without the grieving in the morning, without some sort of symbolic action, um, which could be as simple as just saying it to someone, like turning the feeling into words is itself a symbolic action. Um, without that, would you say that, um, well, I'm definitely going to move it through it slower, if at That's all, it. because my experience has been without the grieving and mourning, I'm, I'm just still feeling it the whole time underneath. Effectively. Yeah. The number one reason why I ask people to consider getting into a community setting where we are intentionally talking about the ups and the downs of opening up, no matter what that looks like for you, the reason I ask you to consider a group is because when you continually revisit this, you'll you will have these realizations of, oh, oh, I, I am experiencing change and loss, and mm-hmm. you'll have a place to name it. Because, like you said, putting it into words is a form of symbolic action. You're bringing something forward and naming it and having it witnessed. And you don't have to share the hardest stuff. Some of, sometimes it's it's simple little things like, oh, I, I miss this about my relationship, or. I didn't know I was going to have to let go of that. Or sometimes it's the celebration of, wow, there's all this new amazingness right. and I have nowhere to share it. Mm-hmm. So putting yourself in a context where you can share it helps you move faster. 
And when I say faster, I don't mean like, oh, we're trying to rush this. But when, well, I actually, I think you're a great example of this. You lived a closeted, non-monogamous life for over 20 years. And God, yeah, more like 25, really. <laughs> but a long time um, without being oh, really uh, out. I'm that sorry, I can't. That checks out. That mouth maths. <laughs> um, yeah. And so when I, when you and I started our re romantic relationship, I went from zero to 60. I went from like believing and understanding myself as monogamous because I didn't know there was anything else to claiming polyamory. Like within 45 days, I was like, boom, here I am. And then we proceeded to, to walk next to each other, grieving, mourning, processing, relationship change. And I noticed that you were still moving at a slower pace mm -hmm. and you still had all the stuff. You were unpacking all the same things I was, even though you had 20 plus years right. experience. That is evidence that not acknowledging and intentionally mourning tends to keep us stuck. Yep. And so I, yes. I see it in my clients all the time too. The, the things that we, when we're trying to like white knuckle and hold it together and pretend like it's all not, it, no, it's all the same and I don't have to experience it, this as loss. I'll only experience it, it as additive. Only that. Toxic positivity. Yes. It doesn't work out and it does tend to keep us stuck. And the new version of ourself can't come into existence. So I think of the morning time as the time when the caterpillar's in the chrysalis and has to turn into goo. Yep. Not like they're not just in there gooey; they turn into goo, and then they reform into they something form entirely into something new. new. Mm -hmm. And that's that. That was my experience, and I, I watch people go through it. And some people will need much longer, but there's a difference between like you are slower paced than I am in these processing ways. Like yep. you're, um, and, and that works across lots of things. Like you are slower paced when you take on other changes too, like yep. almost any change. But it's even That's not the change slower we're talking about. when yeah. I don't actually acknowledge the change right. and do the work of incorporating it into the new version of myself that, yeah, so I think for about whom like, that change isn't a change, it's what is. Right. So the difference between, okay, we're all going to work at our own pace and it took you years to process things that it took me months to process and, yep. and acknowledge, yep. but it took you decades to even get to the starting line. Right. You had grieved nothing. And I, the, one of the ways I knew that is we were in the midst of, of you going through like another real layer of reckoning and, and loss and realizing mm -hmm. like the relationship was changing. And I was listening to you cry about it and hearing you voice things. And I'm like, oh. That happened in your early 20s. Yeah, it's a long time Okay, there's ago. a lot of unprocessed mm -hmm. material in there. Okay. And I, I'm here for it. But wow, that made your experience far more challenging than mine. Um, so I recommend being intentional and embracing the opportunity that grief work and mourning is. Yes. And it really can be. And if you're if you're struggling with this and you really are stuck on the idea of grief or mourning, then another way to conceive of this is as a rite of passage. We're going to do another episode on building rites of passage. Um, I work on rites of passage in non-monogamy. I'm actually writing a chapter on it um, for a, a book, a scholarly book right now. But you can conceive of any transformative mourning process as a form of rite of passage as well. So if if all this said, if like everything we've said, you're like, nope, I'm still a full stop, fuck you. No, I'm not doing it. Okay. Try calling it a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. How do you need to process that? What yeah. do you need to let go of? What do you need to acknowledge and how? And And just using those words, just shifting the words for some people makes the difference. Um, so as we wrap up, I want to, I want to, and I don't want to go on and on about this in the morning section because you have to invent it yourself. I teach people a very specific process. Um, I, I offer a grief ritual inside of the year of opening, um, a, a very specific template for people to develop for themselves. And that's because I think a lot of us struggle with understanding like what would be included, but for me, the core of it is getting clear on what it is that I am acknowledging 
Like, what is it that I am either letting go of or resisting letting go of, but I want to, or celebrating letting go of? What is that? Naming it, whether that's the exclusivity as the way you feel loved or um, the your social monogamy. Are you letting go of that? Are you or letting go of not having to negotiate everything? Like if you've been living an implicit, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. an implicit relationship life and you're like, I never had to have these conversations. We didn't need relationship check-ins. Maybe you're letting go of the unproductive um, simplicity. Like, oh, we could, like, we can't do what we need to do without putting in all this new relational tools and methods and work. But, but I, oh, I kind of miss just being able to be lazy about it. Yeah. And, and I remember uh, you hated that. You were really resistant at the beginning. Because I, I, I was, was like, we need check-ins and we need this and we need we need repair tools. And you were like, I never minute. used to need any of those things. <laughs> yep. And so, and the 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 grieving in the morning, saying that that was how I felt about it. Oh, I miss being lazy. Not necessarily a sentence that I wanted to hear myself say, but it was true. Yeah. And so and- by saying it, it let me, because I don't feel that way anymore. That That isn't, like, I don't That's miss it. That's not true anymore. No. It's not yeah. true anymore because I let myself feel that and take the steps that allowed me to become the new person who didn't feel like it was effort like that, or that it wasn't work to do these things. Yeah. And by the way- one of the ways we can tell that there's a a really big endemic change happening within us is your values may shift. Mm -hmm. People talk about values as if they never shift. Bullshit. Of of course course they they do. do. As you grow, mature, change. And I saw you shift from having a strong value around ease and simplicity and easefulness and starting to prioritize your value of complexity and intentionality. And and I saw what I saw was that you were mourning, oh, before I was prioritizing intentionality and leaning into complexity, I there were lots of things I didn't have to do. There were actions I didn't have to take. There were conversations I didn't have. And so the value of ease and simplicity is not a bad value. That's that's fine. You get to have that. But as you shifted them, there was something to grieve within you. There was, there was, there was work to be done that before you didn't have to do. And, but now I see you, I actually detest that level of not like, now I see you getting frustrated, not at ease. Now you, you seem to move with easefulness as like a way that you be with your complexity. It's like the two, your values Mm -hmm. have re-emerged and now you're like, Mm -hmm. oh, actually I don't have to choose, but for a while you were choosing. Yeah. And I thought it was beautiful that you um, you just acknowledged that and you didn't know what to do about it, but you brought the three big pieces together. Um, I watched you, before I even knew how to use language around this, you brought intentionality to the process. You named it. You named the thing that you were sad about letting go. And then you ritualized it. And I think for you, this came out of um, your work with the nature community. Yes, it did. Yep. Um, Which- and from- I'm glad I had that foundation to to stand on because I felt like I had skills in that area. Yeah. So that I and my imagination contained it. it. Wasn't even so much about the skills. My imagination contained the idea of symbolic action. And for me it came from my work as a doula mm-hmm. and my my early training. I started training to be a midwife. I and I didn't follow down that path, but there is that the 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 same technology um, the, uh, the, let's bring intentionality to the situation and let us now ritualize it because mm-hmm. uh, the, the different communities that we have found ourselves in have all had this element of, yep, we're going to take ritual action. And that can be as simple as writing a letter down, reading it out loud and burning it in a, in a small fire. Uh, you know, like it, it could be that, that that's a ritual action. Um, I love using, um, dissolvable paper. I buy that dissolvable mm. magic paper um, yeah. and I'll write things down that I want to let go of and, and dip it into, into water until it's, and, and swish it around. Um, that's a ritual, you know, that I build a ritual around that, but it, the whole ritual could take five minutes. 
If I light a candle, I write this down, I dissolve the paper, I take three deep breaths, I blow out the candle. (laughs) It might be that small, right? So symbolic action can be incredibly small, but this is how our psyche recognizes that we are intentionally self-witnessing. And the other piece of that is not, there is self-witnessing and then there is witnessing each other. And Mm -hmm. you were the very first experience I had of a partner who wanted to do that. Um, I had experienced partnership where there was immense resistance to having to witness someone else's mourning. Like, oh, I don't want to, can we just not have our feelings was the general gist of our household. And now I have friends who are happy to bear witness to my process. um, And we create space for that in year of opening if you have intentionality and clarity of what your intention is, you bring ritual, symbolic action, even tiny symbolic action, writing something in beach sand and allowing the tide to wash it away while you simply watch. That, that it's a tiny symbolic action, that's plenty. And there may be and things. Being, and witnessing the change. Those yeah. are the elements, the core elements. If I were to boil it down and make it as simple as possible. That's what I would ask people to do. Mm -hmm. And there may be things in people's lives um, that that are symbolic actions that they're not even aware are. Most of us have some symbolic action. action. So ritual is habit plus intention. Intention. So if you notice that you do this. Not habit. I'm sorry. Ritual is routine plus intention. Routine. Not habit. It is something that you do. So there are... I get up every morning and I pet the kittens and I feed them. I call that a routine. But if I got up every morning and I picked them up and I walked over to the window and I said, let's look at the sunrise. And then I reached down and I petted them and I fed them. I would call that a ritual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And ritual, it just, it's like it, it opens up space for us to be a little bit more present to our full humanity. And that makes a difference when you're going through a change, when you're going through transformation which we are when we change our relationship structures. And so, those are being having those private rituals is is very very valuable, very valuable. And then having public ones, ones where you share. I yeah. mean, and and the ritual itself might still be private, but you share the results of it. You share what yeah. you did and you share it with your community. That witnessing is a whole other level of it is. um of action that can move you along. And that's one of the things, so um, we're currently planning the the next um, year of opening retreat, and one of the things I'm really excited to bring into embodied space with people is the ability to yeah. witness each other's small acts of ritual. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes we take the actions, and then we just share it in circle. Yep. And if this all sounds woo-woo to you, I just want to remind you that you are talking to a PhD psychologist and a physicist. We do like this is for yeah. everyone. I just yeah, like this is for everyone. I'm gonna just say this because I I am woo adjacent. I love my woo, but we are we are people who also deeply value rationality. Yep. It, you don't have to trade one for the other. You do you not actually get to participate in both. This doesn't have to make sense for it to work. Mm-hmm. It's I mean it works yep. on an I unconscious physics. level. You get into there and you're like, okay, we know all kinds of things. What is going on in there? What's oh, you mean quantum physics? Here? No, I don't want to that, talk about and it. And quantum <laughs> physics is just one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is for everyone, absolutely. And it is for the rational and the not rational. <laughs> <laughs> I the the some of us tap into the um ways of knowing beyond the human yep sense of logic and ration all the time. Others of us really feel more comfortable there. Everybody can yeah. do this. And mm-hmm. by the way, apes do this, elephants do this. Yeah. Other uh, like this We're is this is about the more than human world too. So, um as we wrap up, I want to just circle back to the fact that we started by by talking about grief and never really talked too much about the fact that non-monogamy itself is a it is a change just acknowledging that you are ex- you're you're expanding your horizons about what is possible in your relationship you do not have to have committed to like i'm polyamorous now you don't have to have claimed a new identity you may be just exploring but simply allowing yourself to enter into the question of wow what if 
what if exclusivity is not going to be the primary focus of my romantic relationships? Or what if I am going to let go of my right to claim that my partner is not is monogamous and I'm going to mm-hmm. what if I'm going to maintain mine but I'm going to I'm going to fully embrace that they have that. I like there are so many ways and and there's one more thing. Sometimes when non-monogamy comes up, relationships end. Yeah. Just like sometimes when monogamy comes up, relationships end. <laughs> That's right. Like, yeah. Relationships end. And so this grieving and mourning process is about all the different ways. So if you are if you are ending a relationship, if you are de-escalating a relationship, if you are transitioning a relationship from one form to another, or if you're experimenting with transitioning it into a new form, this can all this can addend and make that process a much more enriching psychological and grounding experience um, rather than just a thing that happened to you. Oh, but if I you love act that. like it is, it, like the the changes that are happening are happening to you, the process is going to take longer and will probably come at a higher psychological cost. So, so we talked about witnessing being important, uh, and, and it is. Um, we have monthly Ask Me Anythings. And yeah, so and that if you is a- have, if you want to share your grief experiences or if you have questions about how to um, work with, an ex- you know, create your own ritual experiences, it's yeah, drop to in. come and ask. The, and the, the Ask Me Anything, so you can sign up and join us and ask me anything, joliehamilton.com forward slash AMA. Um, and we are having them monthly and they're just a, it's just a time to come ask your question and be in community, but you could also come and, and just share. Sometimes people just share a win, something new that's mm-hmm. happened for them. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they share something that is a grief that they don't have another container to talk about it. Um, like, Hey, I, I'm, I made this transition or, um, this relationship isn't going to to make it forward in the form it was in. Yeah, we're here. We're listening. I'm so appreciative of this conversation. Thank you for co-creating it, Ken. Thank you. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people, actually about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60 second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, you'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no Buzzfeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com. And find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not.